Welcome to Paranormality Magazine. Each week, Paranormality Magazine explores all Fortean subjects, from phantoms to UFOs and every cryptid creature in between. Each week, you're treated to a collection of well-researched and investigated stories, interviews, and reports on cutting-edge paranormal projects and topics they know you crave. And here in the podcast, I share stories from the magazine to give you just a taste of what you receive in every issue. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Paranormality Magazine. We begin with the story of time travel, but not through a time machine, but a time portal. Well, more accurately, a time whirlpool. Jack Kirby tells us about the boy who traveled through time. As most readers know, I'm fascinated with the thought of time travel, and one day, hopefully in my lifetime, it will prove to be real. Until then, I will simply keep searching for new cases of time travel and reaching out to those who claim to be from another time. I recently came across the story of Thomas Johnson, a young boy who was sucked into a whirlpool that formed into a lake near his home and emerged 57 years later. I haven't been able to find too many accounts of the story online, although TikTok seemed to be very familiar with the young Thomas's adventure through time which doesn't lend too much credit to the story's authenticity, especially since the end of the story happened in 1970 and I've been unable to locate a single news story of a missing boy returning after 50-plus years. Although it is possible that the news outlet in rural New York hasn't digitized the file yet, it is also possible that the government stepped in and silenced the whole thing. This is the story as told by Reddit user Superman 80782. It happened in July of the year 1912. Thomas was a common child of 10 years who lived with his parents on a farm in New York, but one day when Thomas was playing with his friends near an artificial lake that was also part of his father's farm, it was already there when his father had bought the farm, his father had forbidden him and his friends from playing near the lake as he assured him that very strange things were happening around and inside. From the lake, sometimes animals that went to the lake disappeared under suspicious circumstances and never came back. Thomas was incredulous to these claims of his father and completely ignored the warnings, something that he would possibly regret later. According to the witnesses, suddenly a whirlpool began to form in that small and mysterious lake, the children were speechless, and they could only look with great astonishment at that mysterious phenomenon. Thomas could not contain his curiosity and approached a little to the lake to better see what was happening, when suddenly frightened children witnessed how that whirlpool absorbed him completely, making Thomas disappear in the water. His very frightened friends ran to Thomas's father to alert him of what had happened. His father ran quickly to the lake but it was too late. Later, Thomas's father gave the authorities notice and they also sought Thomas for weeks without finding any sign of the child. His case was finally closed and they never looked for him again. The father of Thomas always blamed himself for what had happened because despite his warnings, he felt he had not done enough to avoid the tragedy. The years passed and the father did not finish completely overcoming the tragic accident of Thomas but something totally unexpected was about to happen. In July 1970, almost 60 years after the tragic and unfortunate event, Thomas's father, now 91, was walking by his property and by that mysterious lake he used to travel to remember the memories of his son when, without warning, he saw with great surprise in the strange lake a swirl beginning to form, exactly similar to the one that absorbed his son. Thomas's father watched from afar and witnessed how this mysterious swirl brought back to the surface his son Thomas, 58 years later. Thomas was totally lost and disoriented. Seeing his dad already very old naturally did not recognize him and was scared at first. 
but after a conversation he knew that it was his father. Thomas was now 15 years old. He'd only aged five years for him, while his father and the world had aged 58 long years. When the authorities learned of the mysterious event, they took their fingerprints, since at first they believed that it could be some deceit or an imposter with the purpose of swindling the poor old man, Thomas's father. But seeing the results, they were completely surprised. When the prints were exactly the same as those of Thomas Johnson, the boy who had disappeared in 1912 when he was only 10 years old. The prints were exactly the same as those of 10-year-old Thomas Johnson. At first read, I'm instantly brought back to my childhood as Flight of the Navigator quickly popped into my head. Then the more recent Prime video series called Outer Range is a story of a man who has a strange black hole on his property that ends up transporting him to the future. With all that aside, let's look at one thing that really pops out at me. They took their fingerprints. Yes, in the 1970s, the police did take fingerprints, but they were mostly of criminals. Not to say they didn't take fingerprints, as they did think he might be a criminal. The real question is what fingerprints did they have to reference them to? Even though fingerprinting had been around since 1000 BC, the first official fingerprint card was developed in 1908, which was four years before the supposed disappearance. But unless this 10-year-old was a criminal, to me it is highly doubtful that Thomas ever had his fingerprints taken. I honestly think that someone told ChatGP to write a story about a child time traveler that sounds believable. I guess my search continues. Perhaps Ronald Mallet will succeed in his attempt to unlock the mysteries of time. The aerial school sighting has been revived and brought to the forefront in recent years, largely in part to several documentaries, and it's well known in the UFO world. A craft landed in a schoolyard in Zimbabwe, and small, gray-like entities were seen by dozens of witnesses, all reporting relatively the same thing. Today it's considered one of the best group sightings on record. Chaz CMP from Paranormal Magazine brings us the story. The skeptical explanation used to explain it has remained the same since it first occurred – mass hysteria. Mass hysteria is the term used to describe a situation in which various people all suffer from similar, unexplained symptoms. And while science is no closer to understanding how or why it occurs, they like to use it as a catch-all explanation to explain away group sightings and events that don't fit into the acceptable paradigm. Mass hysterias have occurred on every continent in the world and have affected people of all ages, all races, and cultural backgrounds. Women are oftentimes cited as being more susceptible to mass hysteria, but this is likely to be an out-of-date sexist model of thought carried over from the last century. But for some reason, these types of hysteria can often be found plaguing schoolhouses, with schools in Africa and Asia being particularly susceptible. Scientific thinkers are often pointing out that countries in these regions have deep cultural and spiritual beliefs, and they say that this is the main contributing factor to this condition. However, despite directly citing spirituality as the source of this phenomenon, they are always quick to flip it back around claiming that everything occurring is simply a physiological reaction to said spirituality and nothing else. I think there's an inherent racism at play here. These types of cases are likely to end up on a paranormal TV show in the West, but when they occur elsewhere, they are exoticized, they become the material of academic papers. I think the same is at play when it comes to the gendering of this phenomenon. A group of men experiencing hysteria is likely to be reported as an actual paranormal event, while women are dismissed as crazy or victims of mass hysteria. 
So with these factors in mind, let's look at some of these reported cases of mass hysteria reported in the same region as the aerial school. As far as mass hysteria goes, the Kalahari region has a fairly regular amount of these cases that is compared to the rest of Africa, which on the whole has a pretty high level. Every few years, a large episode seems to occur in a schoolhouse that garners international attention, although it rarely gets more than an odd couple of paragraphs. One of the most recent incidents from the Kalahari occurred in 2019 in the capital of Botswana, Gaborone. This hysteria came in the form of an undescribed illness. It was said that at the start of the year, a group of 67 students began showing symptoms, although these symptoms are not described in the report. By March, local media was reporting that over 200 students had now been affected, and the school was forced to close. Village officials brought in priests and religious officials from the surrounding area to try and alleviate the hysteria, but this had little effect. As of January 2020, there has been no update on this story. This type of hysteria is one of the most common, the spreading of a non-existent disease. Other forms, though, can be even more startling. Take this case from neighboring Namibia. It started with a single student. At around 10 one morning, this student began to scream. The screams were about a ghost that the student was claiming occupied the schoolhouse. The student was so distressed they began throwing desks across the class. Soon, four other students began to act strangely in a similar manner to the first. They were talking in strange, deep voices and were jerking about in an uncontrollable fashion. They began to laugh in this demonic-sounding voice and started to call out the names of other students. Parents were, naturally, upset. Many threatened to transfer their children. Others blamed the church, as its services were being incorporated into the school at the time. The explanation of hysteria was met with skepticism from the parents. One parent was quoted as saying, "'It's not our children. It is the school that houses these evil things that enter our children.'" Countries that border the Kalahari are also plagued by these school-based maladies. In Zimbabwe, the aerial school sighting is considered by many to be one such incident. But another occurred in 2009. The pupils at Nemanwa Primary School in Chirumbia Communal Lands, Asfingo, were struck with visions of a bizarre nature. They reported seeing snake-like creatures as well as lions, hyenas, and crocodiles. These visions seemed to spread to about six students a day, and those afflicted would either scream wildly or behave like they were in a trance. This school was also church-sponsored, but in this case they brought in priests of a different church to bless the school and declare it safe for use again. Despite this, many parents still transferred their kids. Interestingly enough, it is South Africa where the majority of these reports seem to come from. This may be simply because of a much thinner language barrier present for these cases, as I believe to be the case with UFO sightings from the country as well, but it's interesting that this would seem to contradict the scientific claim that these events are dependent on a strong cultural belief as kids in South Africa are much more likely to come from varying backgrounds and cultures. Yet these kids, like the aerial students, seem to be experiencing the same phenomenon. How can this be rectified in the scientific explanation? One of these instances occurred in 1999 at a high school in Umtata, Eastern Cape of South Africa. It began with just a few female students who passed out suddenly during the school's morning prayers. They were taken to the nurse's office and quickly regained consciousness and continued the day as normal. A few days later, once again during the morning prayer, 50 female students began screaming before falling unconscious. The girls were transported to local hospitals and clinics, but nothing physiological could be found as the source of the outbreak, and mass hysteria became the explanation. Instead, at the principal's behest, a psychological evaluation was conducted to search for a potential cause of this bizarre incident. The typical factors were blamed, 
It was noted that most of the students afflicted came from difficult family backgrounds, that exams were around the corner, and cited living in dormitory-style housing as all contributing factors that might have made the girls act up. But it was also mentioned that a church nearby the school had become a source of satanic rumors. The students and locals of the area had become convinced that the building was housing less than kosher rituals and there was a belief that this might have been the source of the hysteria. However, while the principal of the school made the concession of improving the dormitories, he was strict about not moving the exams and dismissing any student who entertained any witchcraft theories. To his credit, this seemed to work, as there were no further incidents reported after this crackdown. Another incident in 2000 occurred at schools in Mangong and Haidadal in the Free State Province of South Africa. This one spread to nearly 1,500 students of both genders as well as teachers and independent observers who came to witness the spectacle. This one was much milder, however, as these schools seemed to be the source of an itching plague. Once on campus, students would be afflicted with a strange itch and redness. This would only occur on the campuses, but students that had been affected became social outcasts, unable to play with siblings or ride in cabs. Eventually, after fumigation and reassurance, the case stopped, despite no physical source ever being found as the cause. Some suspected Satanism, and others claimed to see pranksters leaving a white powder in the girls' restroom, but none of these rumors were confirmed and mass hysteria remains the official explanation. In 2002, at a primary school in Kwadizuka, KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, a group of students were struck by convulsions and tremors. They would feel nauseous, begin hyperventilating, shiver or be struck with tremors, and then pass out. This case seemed to be spread by line of sight, as one student would witness this and become immediately affected. Twenty-seven students were affected before it was contained. Once again, witchcraft and Satanism were at the top of the suspect list. All kids were better the next day, and hysteria was once again claimed as the source. In 2009, a high school in Pretoria was also struck. It started when one girl began screaming and having convulsions. Within moments, students all over the school in various classes and grades began to show the same symptoms. This time, the episodes were blamed on the suicide of a student which had occurred about two weeks prior to the incident. But oddly enough, this doesn't explain two separate breakouts that occurred in the suburbs of Sunnyside and Laudium the previous week, where students displayed similar symptoms. These students were tested for narcotics but nothing was found in their system, and once again, the community pinned Satanism as the source. Surely a number of these incidents are actual episodes of hysteria, but why is more consideration not paid to the witnesses' accounts? More importantly, why are we dismissing them? Let's consider the Travis Walton case. Some may be familiar with the story from the film Fire in the Sky. For those who are not familiar with it, to sum it up, Seven white adult American men saw their co-workers zapped by a UFO in Arizona and sped off in fright to report it to the police. After a few days, Travis reappeared in a dazed and confused state. It's considered one of the best cases in ufology. But I can't help wonder what would have happened if the case was slightly different. What if, instead, it was seven school-aged black African girls who reported the same thing occurring in rural Africa. Would it still have become the famous case it is today? Want more paranormality? Subscribe to Paranormality Magazine, and each month, get it delivered digitally or via mail in our print version. Paranormality Magazine is a collaborative endeavor featuring works from people like you 
who have a passion for all things mysterious and unexplained. Our goal is the pursuit of knowledge, gathering captivating stories from our own team of writers, researchers, and investigators, as well as from writers such as yourself. Each monthly issue also includes a list of paranormal, horror, UFO, and cryptozoology events around the country, incredible paranormal-themed artwork, articles and writing sent in from our readers, suggested books and podcasts to consume, and more. Visit ParanormalityMag.com and subscribe today for as little as $3.99 a month. That's ParanormalityMag.com. ParanormalityMag.com. A knife-wielding butcher, a beautiful bride in white, and a fisherman named Lewis with the blood of two innocent women on his hands. These are just a few of the many disembodied spirits who roam a group of nine small islands off the shores of Maine and New Hampshire. Writer Molly Briggs brings us the story of the ghosts on the Isles of Shoals. Located six miles off the east coast of the United States are a small group of islands called the Isles of Shoals. Vulnerable to New England's cruel and unrelenting weather, it is a place where only the strong survive. The Isle of Shoals' unforgiving, rocky coastline was settled by the Europeans in the early 17th century. They were established as one of the many fishing areas for the British and French colonies the total area of the islands adding up to only 145 acres. The use of the Isles of Shoals date back over 400 years. It's been used as both a prominent fishing industry and a desired vacation destination. In its infancy, it was also a place where pirates would lay low, escaping penalties for their past crimes. But pirates were not the only nefarious ones to inhabit the islands. Appledore, a territory of Maine, has the distinction of being the largest of the small islands, coming in at 0.5 by 0.6 miles wide. Philip Babb arrived with his family on the island of Appledore during the early 1660s. Babb was known to be an ill-mannered man who was known by many to be wicked and loathsome. Interestingly, he was also reported to have been a shipmate of Captain Kidd, who was said to have murdered his entire crew to protect his buried treasure hidden on the small island birds of a feather do indeed flock together. Along with being a less-than-desirable friend and neighbor, Bab was a butcher, innkeeper, and constable on the island of Appledore. It was in early March 1671 that the butcher lost his life. However, his spirit seems to have decided to stay. The ghostly image of Philip Bab has been seen roaming the island of Appledore's rocky shores during the dead of night, more than a few people have reported seeing a large figure with sunken eyes wearing a butcher's frock and brandishing a knife on the island. One eyewitness stated that he'd seen a mysterious figure walking along the shore of Bab's Cove one night. He described the figure as being large, with hollowed-out eyes and sporting a butcher's frock that glowed. Upon approaching the mysterious figure, the witness let out a shrill scream, causing the apparition to vanish into thin air. Another native of the island had his own story to tell. While leaving his workshop one night, the man encountered a frightening apparition. The witness stated that the ghostly figure began running straight for him, brandishing a knife. Catching a glimpse of his face by the pale moonlight, he reported seeing the unmistakable image of the angry butcher himself, Philip Babb. Turning on his heel, he headed straight for home, his feet barely touching the ground. The following is a story of a more gruesome nature. During the month of June 1872, John Huntfit hired Louis Wagner as a fishing hand to help with the operations of his fishing company. By then, John and his wife Marin had been living on the island of Smutty Nose for two years. Huntfit supplied Louis with a job, food, and a place to live. After working for the Huntfit family for some time, 
Lewis decided to venture out on his own. He purchased a fishing boat with the hope of starting his own business. Unfortunately for Lewis, he crashed his boat, which caused his business to fail, and Lewis suddenly found himself broke and destitute. He was forced to spend his days trolling the docks of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, helping vessels tie up as they entered the wharf to support himself. On the afternoon of March 5, 1873, Lewis caught wind that his old employer John Hontvet and his crew would not be returning home until the following morning. Knowing that the Hontvet cottage would be unattended by John, the out-of-work fisherman devised a plan to burglarize the Hontvet family home. 28-year-old Lewis Wagner stole a dory and rowed roughly 10 to 12 miles from the shore of the Piscataqua River to the small island of Smutty Nose. Now, for all of you, including some of my own family members who believe that a 12-mile trip in a wooden dory would take way too much time for Lewis to have committed the murders, consider this. In 2013, 75-year-old Dan O'Reilly completed Wagner's route from the shore of the Piscataqua to the island of Smutty Nose. He did it in a wooden dory, and he did it in only 2 hours and 14 minutes. So, now we know, never underestimate the power of a determined man. Allegedly, Lewis's plan was to rob the Hauntvet's cottage after the three women inside, Marin, Karen Christensen, and Aneth Christensen had gone to bed. With the women asleep, Lewis had planned to sneak in, steal what he could, and get out without anyone being the wiser. A sinister plan that, by a deadly margin, had failed. Frozen snow could be heard crunching beneath Lewis's feet as he approached the Hauntvet's cottage. He entered through an unlocked door, and in a cruel, premeditated move, he shoved a piece of wood through the latch of the master bedroom's door, locking Marin and her sister-in-law, Aneth, inside. Startled awake by the family's barking dog, Marin's little sister, Karen, mistook Lewis for Marin's husband, John. Groggy and half-awake, she called out to him. In a panic, Lewis beat Karen unconscious with a chair. The other two women, having escaped their room, terrified and recognizing the gravity of the situation, barricaded themselves back inside the bedroom. Marin forced Aneth out through the bedroom window to safety. Unfortunately for her sister-in-law, the decision to escape via the bedroom window landed her right into the waiting arms of Louis Wagner. He took an axe from the woodpile and, raising it above his head, killed Aneth with one fatal blow. Her blood quietly spilling onto the pure white snow. Unable to convince Karen to leave the cottage, Marin ran for her life. Heading for the shore on the far side of the small island, she hunkered down until morning. With the safety of daylight and with frozen feet, Marin waded into the breakwater and began waving her arms, attracting the attention of a family on the neighboring island. Upon realizing Marin had successfully escaped, Lewis headed back to the cottage to fix himself a pot of coffee and a snack but not before delivering the last and final deadly blow to Marin's sister, Karen. Before leaving the home for good, Lewis stole all the money on the property, the sum total of $15. One can't help but wonder what kind of a man would justify taking the lives of two innocent women and forever altering the life of a third for $15, a snack, and a cup of coffee. A full-scale manhunt would eventually deliver Lewis to the proper authorities, and he would be hanged months later for the grisly murder of the two island women. The bones of the Hauntvet Cottage on Smutty Nose Island no longer exist. However, its foundation remains. Strange and unusual occurrences are often reported around where the home once stood. Paranormal enthusiasts have left trinkets on the home's foundation that are said to move left and right without assistance. People have also reported a dark and ominous presence about the island. The smell of coffee and malfunctioning equipment is often recorded as well. Other witnesses have claimed to see and hear strange things around the property of the Hauntvet home, and terrifying EVPs of blood-curdling screams have been captured in the cove along the island's rocky shoreline. Interestingly, most believe that the ghost of Lewis Wagner has remained on the island not to harass and terrify islanders, but to atone for his deadly, unintended actions. I, for one, am not buying it. Lewis may, in fact, also be roaming Smutty Nose Island looking for his axe, 
the survival tool turned deadly weapon used to terminate the lives of the two innocent women. But the joke's on him. The bloody axe is no longer on the small island. It is stored under glass in the Portsmouth Athenaeum. Smutty Nose didn't just attract the likes of innocent Swedish women, it was a stomping ground for pirates as well. The infamous Blackbeard, the most notorious and feared of all the pirates, was drawn to the Isle of Shoals by way of his honeymoon with his fifteenth wife. According to legend, Blackbeard hid his gold all over the small 25-acre island. However, like most honeymoons, nothing lasts forever. The infamous pirate was soon called away to battle British warships. Before he departed, Blackbeard instructed his wife to stay on the island and guard his gold. Alas, unlike the legendary luck of the Irish, Blackbeard's luck eventually ran out. He was killed off the coast of North Carolina. Death by decapitation. Compliments of Captain Maynard. Waiting years on the tiny island for her villainous husband to return, Blackbeard's blushing bride eventually died. Never having received closure for her groom's failed return, she is said to roam the island, continuing to honor her dastardly husband's order to protect his gold. The ghost of Blackbeard's bride is also said to speak to those who would listen, assuring visitors and islanders alike that he will be back. Witnesses have reported seeing a woman in white staring out into the ocean, saying, he will be back. Eerie EVPs have been collected on the island of Smutty Nose confirming such events. Others have reported seeing the ghostly apparition of Blackbeard himself. Moving on, we mustn't forget Star Island, the island that is now considered a favorite for spiritual retreats. Once a desolate, uncharted no-man's land, Star Island has evolved into a bustling hotspot for those seeking to connect with the holier side of themselves. With little Wi-Fi, no cable, and spotty cell service, the odds are more than likely that an energetic connection would be your best and only bet. Two sisters, born and raised in Kittery Point, Maine, spent most of their fair share of time on Star Island since the 1920s, and they've got a few thrilling ghost stories of their own. One sister spoke of waking up in the Oceanic House, hearing furniture being moved throughout the night in the floor above her room. Inquiring about the noise the next morning, she was told no one was up there. Attending a lecture a couple of years later, she learned the area above the space that she'd been sleeping was referred to as Ghost Alley. One of the sisters also recalled being a substitute ranger on the island of Smutty Nose. Filling in one night for the ranger on duty, she excitedly rowed her boat from Star Island to Smutty Nose, eager to embark on a solo overnight shift. A little before 1 a.m., she was awoken by the latch rattling on the back door of the Haley House. Upon investigating the noise, the rattling stopped. No sooner did she fall asleep than the rattling started again. She heard the rattling for a third time, but this time it was coming from the room underneath the stairs. Suffice to say, she was more than taken aback, as she knew she was all alone on the island. The same sister tells another scary tale of an early morning spooky experience. Pounding was heard on the front door of the Haley House, again with not another soul on the island. She also claimed to have been locked inside an outhouse on Smutty Nose Isle, with only two sleeping companions on the island with her. But ghostly legends are not meant for land alone. A favorite phantom story of mine tells of a ship by the name of Isidore who shipwrecked succumbing to the deadly nature of the sea immediately surrounding the Isle of Shoals in the year 1842. People have sporadically reported seeing the Isidore patrolling the bays, but only for a few moments at a time, before her ghostly apparition vanishes before their eyes. Do ghosts exist? I'm not sure we'll ever know. However, what we know for sure is that there are nine tiny islands quietly guarding the shores of both Maine and New Hampshire. And like all good New Englanders, she holds her secrets very close to her vest. The remote group of what some believe are uninhabitable New England enclaves hold not only chilling ghost stories worth their weight in gold, but also the gold itself. Gold that to this day Blackbeard and his obedient bride continue to guard. 
till death do they part. You're sitting at home alone. Alone except for your faithful animal companion. They stare at a seemingly empty space in the room. They appear on edge. Your cat's hair raises on its back. Your dog lets out a bark followed by a growl of caution. A chill runs down your spine as you wonder, what has triggered this unusual behavior? Paranormality Magazine's Greg Morrill tells us about paranormal pets. There is a strong history in folklore of animals, their connection to the spirit world, and their ability to sense what we cannot. Cats were held in high regard in ancient Egypt, said to be magical creatures associated with protection and good fortune. Deities such as Bastet, a feline-headed goddess, was regarded as a maternal figure, representing a mother's love, both tender and protective. Since medieval times, certain pets and wildlife were considered to aid witches and healers magically in their craft. Those companions are better known as familiars. I put out the question, does your pet sense the paranormal, on my Instagram account, all.the.weird, and was able to collect the following information. Monique Rose is a paranormal writer, investigator, and co-host of her podcast, Fright Life, alongside her husband, Joss. She recently made these observations. I was cleaning the bathroom last week and the rest of my family were out of the house. I love being alone and never have an issue being scared or anything. It was midday and I was focused on cleaning when I suddenly felt like I was being watched. Just a weird, ominous feeling. My dog, who was asleep on the bath mat next to me, woke up and stared into the hallway. Monique, being a seasoned investigator, instinctively grabbed her phone to record the incident. By the time I got my phone, he was over it. <laughs> Not the best video, but shows I thought something was weird. The video did appear to show the canine companion intrigued by something outside the bathroom. Carly Latham, also a writer at Paranormality Magazine, frequently observed strange behavior from her dog in her former residence. Carly says, there were a few times he would stare at a spot on the ceiling and growl. That spot led to my bedroom. We'd be downstairs and he'd look up and growl. However, Carly remained skeptical, saying, he barks a lot, but he doesn't usually growl with such focused attention. It could have been something critter-like. I never figured it out. My fellow Canadian paranormal enthusiast, Megan Dykeman, brought a particularly curious incident to my attention concerning her cat. While watching a documentary by Small Town Monsters on YouTube, both of her feline friends became alert to alleged Bigfoot noises in the documentary. Megan continues, I've always believed animals can sense the paranormal when humans don't always. I typically always listen to any type of audio like that on headphones but had it on my TV on YouTube. The one cat ran towards it and jumped right up to the speaker, and her back was arched and she seemed very curious. My other cat, however, got super on edge. Her head was swiveling and she started breathing really heavy. She reacts like this to dogs slightly, but again, you could tell the sound was something that alerted her immediately. I feel it's important to look at the biology of animals in order to explore this phenomenon. According to PawsChicago.org, a dog's sense of smell can be a hundred thousand times greater than a human's. They can hear sounds of much higher frequencies and at a distance of four times more than ours. While their vision is less focused than ours, they are proven to have a wider field of view, night vision, and better sensitivity to physical movements. AnimalWellnessMagazine.com says a domestic cat has 14 times greater smelling capability than humans. Cats' ears, which also hear much higher frequencies, contain 32 muscles compared to our six, making them able to rotate them up to 180 degrees. With much greater ability to see in the dark, 
Their vision, like dogs, is less focused than our own. It's hard to say what these pets are reacting to. Was there a movement imperceptible to you? Did another dog bark down the street that you're physically incapable of hearing? Or is it something unexplainable altogether? Thanks for listening to Paranormality Magazine. Get more information about the magazine and subscribe to our monthly publication at ParanormalityMag.com. That's ParanormalityMag.com. Or click the link in the show description. And if you're a researcher or investigator, send us your stories. We might feature you in our next issue. If you have a paranormal podcast, you can add it to our website so our readers can find your show. And artists, if you'd like your work to be featured in our magazine or on our back cover, contact us. Again, our website is paranormalitymag.com. I'm Darren Marlar, and I'll have more paranormal for you next time from Paranormality Magazine.